Right. I know that uh, still is not quarter of an hour after. It's not the academic quarter has not been completed yet. But uh, let us start because we have a lot of interesting things to hear and more to discuss. So, uh, I would like to welcome you all in today's uh, special lecture on the occasion of the 30 years since the establishment of Fourth. Just uh, want to remind you, to those of you who are new ones here, that in this series of public lectures, distinguished scientists from different fields of natural sciences, uh, economics, humanities, present their work and their achievements, and they discuss the frontiers and the prospects in their fields. So today, we have the great honor and pleasure to have with us Professor Donald Ingber, who has, been, who has made groundbreaking contributions in the fields of cells and tissue engineering, angiogenesis, cancer research, and nano nanobiotechnology. His work in biomimetic engineering has opened new avenues in understanding the mechanisms through which cells respond to signals and coordinate to produce tissues and living organs with a specialized form and function. His uh, most recent uh, innovation is a methodology he has developed for building tiny three-dimensional living human organs called organs and chips and providing which is a technique which may provide very critical information for di diagnostic and therapeutic therapeutic applications drug delivery and other things, and we are going to hear, suppose, some of these things. Don is the founding director of the Viz Institute of Biology Inspired Engineering at Harvard University. Uh, he is professor of vascular biology at Boston Children's Hospital and at Harvard Medical School, and professor of bioengineering at Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. So he's really a multidisciplinary individual. Don is world leader in the emerging field of biological inspired engineering and at the Viz Institute he oversees an effort, a multifaceted effort to identify the mechanisms that living systems use to build, control and manufacture and to apply these design principles to develop advanced materials and devices. He also leads the biomimetic microsystems platform in which microfabrication techniques are used to build as I said earlier, tiny living organs and chips. Don has authorized more than 325 publications at high impact factor journals. He uh, has uh, over 70 patents and has received numerous honors and distinctions, including the award from the Biomedical Engineering Society, award from the American Society for Investigative Pathology, Lifetime Achievement Award from the Society of In Vitro Biology and the Development of, Def of Defense Breast Cancer Innovator Award. And he's also a member of the Institute of Medicine and National Academies and a fellow of the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering. Today, he's going to present to us his recent work on uh, organs and chips and also he's going to tell us a few things about his institute, which from the discussion we had earlier on, seems to be a prototype institute for bringing innovation close to the market for exploiting the outcome of research. So it is a model institute in this respect and a model approach. We are very happy to have done with, with us and let's hear what he has to tell us. So, Don. Well, thank you so much. Um, as you heard, I'm, I'm uh, here as, uh, as, I've been at Harvard for about 30 years, but I, I, in the last four and a half, I was 
become the founding director of the Wyss Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering. <coughs> and I thought I'd start by a few slides just giving you an overview because I think it's really a harbinger of things to come. It's sort of a new model for innovation, collaboration, and technology translation that maybe uh, might stimulate you to think about how you do things here as well. Um, basic story is that the Institute started about, probably about eight years ago now, I was asked by the provost of Harvard University to help co-chair a committee to envision the future of bioengineering across all of Harvard and its hospitals. And to make a long story short, what we all came to is that we all could see that bioengineering transformed medicine over the past 50 years by taking engineering principles, trying to solve medical problems. You have the stent, the pacemaker, hip implants, drug delivery, et cetera. And, um, and, uh, but we could see that we looked around the room and all of us were working in each other's fields. I've published in physics journals and optics journals and computer science journals. They're publishing in physicists and biology journals. And with nanotechnology and biology funding over the past 50 years, 20 years, we've basically really begun to uncover a huge amount of information about how nature builds, controls, and manufactures from the nanoscale up. And so we said that the future actually is gonna be a little bit different. It's gonna be one where we're gonna leverage biological design principles that we've uncovered to develop new engineering innovations. And that's what we call biologically inspired engineering. And so uh, our logo is this, it's one of self-assembly because we started from zero people in January of 2009, I guess one, I was there. Um, and we're, we've now grown uh, quite a bit. Um, and, uh, but the vision that the faculty had was for an institute that would transform healthcare industry and the environment by emulating the way nature builds with two goals, to discover nature's design principles as all of us have been doing for years, but really the core is to engineer biologically inspired materials and devices to revolutionize healthcare and enhance sustainability. It wasn't just medical because we felt that work going on in the non-medical area in terms of solid freeform manufacturing, uh, polymers, chemistry, physics, materials, nanotechnology, could impact medicine and vice versa. And that really has turned out to be true. So quick overview, we were launched in January 2009 with the single largest gift in Harvard's history of a $125 million gift from hans Jörg Wies. Harvard is also contributing a significant amount to the effort as well. The focus was to be on high risk research and technology development, explicitly things that government would not usually fund. Government usually funds incremental advances and, that, and really to span academia and industry, the donor said, I know big companies, they're great at product development, but they can't innovate. I know academics do innovative things, but they often just publish papers, nothing ever happens. I wanna see a startup in the midst of the world's greatest academic environment that's gonna span this chasm. So we started by bringing together 14 core faculty at a common site. We've grown in four and a half years to 350 full-time staff. We have over 750 activating collaborators. And we organize not by, we don't give faculty lab space. Our existing faculty have their old labs, but parts of their groups come together in what we call collaboratories, which are focused on project. And when the project ends, that space will be used for something else. Extremely novel, I was trying to describe earlier, we just, we've recruited 40 expert technical staff from industry with 10, 20 or more years of experience in product development and even team management who we integrate with students and fellows and faculty who actually can bring products towards, bring ideas towards a product inside the academic institute. And then we're structured to harness the whole Boston-Cambridge region because we felt in the time of international competitiveness, it's really hard to compete with Boston Cambridge if you're gonna do biotech and, and pharma and material science and robotics and so forth, and medicine in particular. We're not in any school at Harvard. We have a, lot, a formal alliance with Harvard, all of its hospitals, which are separate institutions, University of Massachusetts, Boston University, Tufts University, and we're talking to others, and their people can be on site, and we could all work together. And just last week, Based on our success, we've actually just got a second $125 million gift. So this is really quite an amazing initiative. What's novel is that our measures of success have academic ones, great you know, international recognition, great people, but we also are being measured on the intellectual property portfolio we generate, the patents, corporate alliances, licensing agreements, and startups, and having technologies in the product pipeline in five years. And because we've been so successful at this, we've actually 
that's how we closed on the gift. We started by bringing together some of the most incredibly brilliant entrepreneurial and I'd say quirky faculty, people like George Church and Joanna Eisenberg and Jim Collins from BU and George Whitesides and chemistry and, and Kit Parker and Dave Edwards and uh, Rob Wood in robotics and Dave Mooney in materials and Mahadevan in mathematical modeling. And then we've recruited additional faculty and over time Jennifer Lewis in materials, 3D fabrication just joined us. <coughs> so we're up to 18 core faculty now. And so we brought these thought leaders in the field together. We have these people from industry we call the technology team. They're also our institutional memory when students and fellows leave projects off and end their tasks with keeping them going. And then we bring, we develop collaborations with industry, clinicians, and even regulatory agencies very early on because they know what the problems are, they tell us what the problems are, and this helps us. In science, you could, you could follow 16 different paths, all valid, but why not follow the shortest distance to get to where you want to go, which is to have impact. And my executive management team, who happened to both be Greek, um, came just from the startup world, and so that's how we create this sort of pipeline. And then the final slide is that we don't give out grants. We don't ask individuals to write their idea because we want people to work collaboratively. We fund six platforms that we call enabling technology platforms, and these are groups of people, because everything's people. Faculty, staff, students, fellows, clinicians, who are jointly trying to develop cutting edge technological capabilities, a whole new approach that will enable a new wave of materials and devices, not just one thing. And they range from uh, autonomous home healthcare types of diagnostics and, and, and therapeutic devices to synthetic biology, genome engineering, uh, responsive building materials and energy materials, robotics that self-organize and adapt and have swarm-like behavior. But the two that I'm going to focus on today are called biomimetic microsystems and programmable nanomaterials. And I'm going to go deeper here to give you an idea, examples of, of what, I, what we do. So I lead a platform called biomimetic microsystems. And the long-term view is to engineer microchips containing living human cells that reconstitute organ-level functions, not cell, not tissue, but organ-level functions for drug screening, diagnostic, toxicology, and therapeutic applications. And we want to do this all with human cells eventually, so human organs on chips. And the long-term goal is to accelerate drug development and replace animal testing. But before I go into that, uh, let me tell you where it began. George Whitesides and I, 20 years ago, started to adapt computer microchip manufacturing techniques that he had been working on, such as t t he developed new forms of computer microchip manufacturing, like soft lithography, microcontact printing, and he's starting to apply it to studies with living cells. You might ask, well, why would anyone do that? And the reason is that <coughs> computer microchip fab fabrication gives you control over feature scale at the same size scale that living cells and tissues live at, so you're in the nanometer to micrometer scale. So you can actually build things at the scale with, with fine textures and resolutions and forms um, that, cells, that cells normally live at. We also, did, George also started working on microfluidic systems, and so the first path that I got into these organs on chips was for microfluidics. So microfluidics where you take microchip manufacturing where you use photolithographic etching, for example, and you can make um, hills and valleys and so forth. And then you take uh, flexible polymer, polydimethyl siloxane, PDMS, pour it on it, polymerize it, it's a sil clear silicon rubber, take it off, and then it conformally seals to glass or other substrates. And what you have are little microvascular networks, almost like capillary networks, with channels. And this has been used to miniaturize all sorts of instrumentation. What used to be the size of a room is now the size of a toaster. And they're very interesting because um, if you have multiple tributaries, like little, little small tributaries forming a big river, and you have individual flows of different color, there's no mixing because you only get laminar flow due to the physics. If you remember Reynolds' number, which governs turbulence, it's a function of radius. If you're below about a millimeter, you, just, you, ha you cannot get turbulence. So you basically don't have any mixing over quite a long distance. And so, this people are using to do all sorts of chemical reactions and to handle different sort of fluids. I have a medical background and I, and I thought, well, you know, wh while the whole microfluidics field is using this for diagnostics, I thought, could it actually be used as a therapeutic? And the idea was the following. 
The idea was that patients who have sepsis, where you have an, an infection with a pathogen, but it, it's systemic, it goes in your blood, it's, it's incredibly high death rate, mortality rate, something like 30 to 50 percent. So the idea was, could we cleanse the body of pathogens, much, much like a dialysis machine does with ions, but you can't use a membrane because the pathogens are bigger than a pore in a dialysis membrane. So the idea was that you could have sort of an extracorporeal device where blood goes out of a vein, through this device, and then back in another vein. And the idea was to cleanse the blood of pathogens, specifically without, without having any negative impact on the blood. So the idea was if you could have the blood flow out, and you had little magnetic nanometer-sized particles that are coated with something that binds the pathogen, that as it passes through this device, and you have isotonic sterile saline coming in the other channel, these two would flow by each other. There's no membrane. There's no boundary. They don't mix because they're laminar. And if you have a magnetic field gradient that would pull the magnets and the, that are bound, particles bound to the pathogen, they would go out with the discard saline and the cleansed blood would go back to the patient. It was a really simple idea. And actually, it was so simple it actually worked. So these are red blood cells and the green are beads. And without a magnet, comes in the top, goes down the top, put the magnet at the bottom, the red blood cells go back and the beads and bound pathogens go out in the discard path. And we put antibodies on these beads for known pathogen, which in this case was a fungus, Candida albicans, we also did E. coli bacteria. And these are human blood, these are red blood cells, these are the green fungi, and the red, beads, the red dots are the beads. And this actually worked quite well. We can get 85% purification in a single pass, but very low flow rates. And there were two big problems. The first was these not very robust, if anybody does microfluidics, if the pressures were off at all, you would either dilute the blood or concentrate the blood, and that's not going to be useful. And the other was that you don't know what the patient has as an infectious agent when they come to the emergency room. You don't know that it's, you know, it, it's an E. coli or a, or a C. albicans. So we needed some kind of generic binding capacity for this. So the first way we, problem we solved was by developing a device that looks more like the spleen. It's more bioinspired. It actually, the spleen actually has uh, arteries and arterioles and then a sinusoid type network that's almost like wetlands in that the blood trickles through, it slows down so that you have lots of cleansing and then it comes back into the vein. So here we made little sinusoidal um, connectors and this actually overcame the problem of blood diluting and concentrating. To deal with not knowing what the pathogen is, we looked to nature again and we went to the innate immune system. Our bodies have the ability to we have proteins in our blood that are called opsonins. This is millions of years of evolution. The first immune system that we developed was something that will recognize sugars that are on any type of pathogen, but not on our cells, mannans, they're called. And the most well-developed one is called mannose binding lectin. And this has been shown to bind to over 90 different pathogens, including gram-negative and positive bacteria fungi, viruses, and even some toxins. And this is a great example of the Wyss Institute. I'd started this project before the Institute. I'd even had the idea of using opsonins before the Institute, but I had never done anything because I didn't even know where to start. One of the first hires at the Institute had worked in industry, in the pharmaceutical industry, doing protein engineering, and he actually had worked in his thesis on mannose binding lectin, so we bought some, tried it, it worked. But then he protein, he genetically engineered it to take out domains that would be a problem, like their domains that induce complement fixation and blood coagulation, which obviously would cause the whole device to clot up. He deleted them. He just took the business end of the molecule, these head groups. He put on an FC at the end because from in pharma he knows it's a great way to purify proteins in one step. And then he put a biotinylation group at the tip so we could actually orient them on the beads exactly like we wanted to at high density and make multivalent ligands, which is how they function in vivo. So what we have is what we call a magnetic opsonin, a bead coated with these ligands at high density and correct orientation. And when you add these to, to bugs, here colorized, these are Staph aureus, E. coli, and these are fungi. With 128 nanometers, you get nanometer beads, you get very efficient binding of the bacteria. Use a little bigger beads for the fungi because they're bigger and, it, and you, you, be, you get a better um, match in terms of binding. But in red, these are pathogens, well, all of these have been 
previously shown in the literature to be bound by mannose binding lectin. With our engineered, we get as good or better binding, and we've confirmed in red, and we've confirmed in uh, antibiotic resistant pathogens as well. And then we've improved the device as I described. And so what you see here is we have an incredible machine shop at the Institute, so we could actually build an FDA approved materials. And this is a device, these little, the little slits here, which you'll see in the movie now at the left. And, these, and the, so at the left, these little slits are the sinusoids. These are magnets over, over the top. The blood's at the bottom, the saline's on the top, and you're gonna see in a second. Here's blood with pathogens in it, and now you put fluorescence on, and the fluorescent beads you can see are being pulled out of the blood, which is continuing to flow, and out in the saline discard. So it works extremely efficiently. In fact, we can get near 100% clearance of both bacteria and fungi um, at rates up to almost a liter an hour, which is orders of magnitudes higher than we did in the beginning. And we can do many different pathogens. These are four types of fungi and two types of bacteria. We can also do endotoxin because the same protein binds toxin. Endotoxin is one of the major toxins released by bacteria that actually causes systemic organ failure and death. And we can get 99% of this cleared from flowing blood in just a couple hours going through this device. Now this is all in vitro. So recently we set up a little rat intensive care unit where we have a living rat and we have, just like I said, going out one vein and coming through the device, little pumps, this is the device, the magnets are over here, and then it comes back into the rat. And we basically injected, um, in this one I think we were using uh, Staph aureus where we inject pathogens and we could show that we can remove 90% of these pathogens from blood. Uh, I'm sorry, this isn't human blood, this is rat, within an hour. And we could, we could basically bring the levels down much lower than seen. If we do histological sections, the lungs of the control are filled with bacteria and they're just very few in, in, with the cleansing of the device. But what's more impressive is if you inject endotoxin, lethal dose, 100% of the animals die in about four hours, 85% survive on this device. So this is something that we are actually, we have extensive funding of to go to large animals, to pigs, so that we can go to humans in the near future. But, so this is a simplistic idea of an organ on a chip. We're mimicking organ function using microchip technology. But when the Institute started, we really wanted to target high-risk projects. And so what well, we've looked around and we really felt that the biggest challenge in the medical field is actually that the whole drug development model is broken. Those of you from microengineering know the classic Moore's Law diagram that computer power doubles every 18 months as microchips pack more on them and they actually get cheaper. What probably very few have, have ever heard of is called Eroom's Law. It's the opposite of Moore's Law, and it's that the number of medicines invented halves every nine years. So actually, the amount of funding has gone up like exponentially, and the number of new drugs has dropped, and this has been a huge problem. And a large reason is that it takes $2 million to test a single compound. It years, takes years to complete the studies. Innumerable animal lives are lost, so it has real ethical implications. And then more often than not, results in animals don't predict what happens in humans. So imagine in the lab, if we were to tell you as a student, you know, design your experiment based on something that you know is wrong over 50% of the time. It's absurd, but this is the way the drug development industry works worldwide. And thus there's a lack of new drugs reaching patients. So everyone knows we need better models. Most people are working on cell-based models, stem cell-based models, and tissue engineering. We felt that you need to model whole organ level function to really make a difference. And so we had a major breakthrough in a science paper three years ago now, and we call it a human breathing lung on a chip. And the idea is that the major functional unit of the lung is the air sac, the alveolar capillary interface. This is where you have gas exchange, aerosol-based drug delivery, metastasis, pneumonias, uh, airborne particulates from smog, and, um, and, and it's a basically a simple structure. There's air. If you go to electron microscopic level, there's air. There's a single layer of lung epithelial cell. There's a flexible 
porous extracellular matrix known as basement membrane. And then on the opposite side of the same porous membrane is the capillary endothelial cell, and then there's blood. But what's not seen here is that it's an incredibly mechanically active structure because every time we breathe, this expands, and we breathe out, it re retracts. And blood is flowing by the whole time. So if we're looking to be inspired by nature, to build, to go from tissue to organ, what defines an organ is more than two different types of tissue that come together and new functions emerge. It's usually a tissue-tissue interface that's key between a blood vessel and the, and the tissue parenchyma. So it's tissue-tissue interface, there's flow, and in this case, cyclic breathing motions. So again, we reached out to computer microfabrication techniques because we have control over feature scales uh, that, that have, are relevant. And this movie is going to describe how this works because it does it better than I can, faster than I can. So hopefully this will work. The lung on a chip is crystal you clear, flexible, and about the size of a small computer memory stick. But it contains tiny so hollow... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it back. Okay, here we go. The lung on a chip is crystal clear, flexible, and about the size of a small computer memory stick. But it contains tiny hollow channels created using microchip fabrication techniques. A porous, flexible membrane separates the two channels at the center of the device. The opposite sides of the membrane are lined by human lung and capillary blood vessel cells. This mimics the arrangement of lung and blood vessel cells in the air sac of the lung. Application of cyclic suction in side channels makes the entire flexible sheet and cells stretch and relax rhythmically, just like our lung cells do when we breathe. In the lung on a chip device, air flows over the top of the human lung cells, and a liquid medium containing human white blood cells flows below the capillary cell layer. To test how well the lung on a chip device replicates the natural responses of living lungs, we introduce bacteria into the air channel to mimic an infection. And we introduced white blood cells to the blood channel. We then saw the white blood cells migrate across the capillary cell layer, through the pores of the central membrane, and into the airspace where they engulfed the bacteria. Here's a video that shows this response in real time viewed through the device. The tissue cells are not visible here, but we can see white blood cells flowing freely in the capillary channel of the device, just as they do in blood vessels of a healthy person. But when we infect the air channel by adding bacteria, the immune cells abruptly stick to the surfaces of the capillary cells on the opposite side of the membrane, located directly below the infection site. Here's a magnified view showing a migrating white blood cell making its way through the first capillary cell layer, wriggling through the pentagonal hole in the flexible membrane, and then moving out of focus to the other side. When viewed from the air channel, with all cells visible, you can see a round white blood cell popping up from below. Just like in a real lung infection, the white blood cells, which are now colored red, engulf and kill the clean bacterial invaders. So what you just saw was the entire human inf inflammatory response in real time at high resolution in this little rubber chip. So this is a crystal clear PDMS silicon rubber chip. Now, I don't think most people think that the pharmaceutical industry just like screens through chemicals, high throughput, and looks for drugs. They, they all know how to do high throughput screening, but that is not what they're really interested in. They really need to understand mechanism, toxicity, and so forth. So this is extremely exciting. You can't do this in animals, um, and you're doing it with human. So we were funded, um, our initial funding came from uh, National Institute for environmental health sciences in the United States, and they're interested in nanotoxicology, and I'm a cell biologist by training, and I've gone to nanotoxicity meetings, and I'm always amazed that 100 nanometer particles get in places that should not be possible, like across the blood-brain barrier, across the seminiferous tubule. And so we started to pursue this using this approach because most airborne nanoparticles, like in smog, come across the lung. And so because we can do high-resolution imaging, we could also do microfluorimetry, and we can measure reactive oxygen species, which is a great readout for injury, um, used in the device. And we used colloidal silicon nanoparticles of 12 nanometers, which are classic simulants of airborne particulates. In our science paper, we did 
numerous different nanoparticles, uh, nano carbon nanotubes, et cetera. But these are the classic simulants. So when we looked at injury, what we found was there was no injury um, just by breathing motions or by giving these nanoparticles. But if you had physiological breathing motions and nanoparticles, you had injury. And this actually scaled with inflammation. You got expression of ICAM-1 on endothelial cells, which is an activation marker that mediates adhesion of neutrophils. So you actually got a mechanical induction of inflammation only when they're nanoparticles. So it's, and these are not injur injurious def deformations, they're physiological. You can also see that these nanoparticles are taken up by cells when you do confocal microscopy, but again, without breathing motions, there were very little uptake. So if you had done this study on a dish or a trans wall, you wouldn't see anything. And we could actually measure bioavailability, like in our bodies, if we breathe something, does it go into our blood circulation? Because we could measure the outflow <coughs> of the vascular channel when we put nanoparticles in the air channel. And again, there was an eight to 10 fold increase in absorption of these particles across two cell layers and the membrane, which is coated with extracellular matrix. I should mention that. It has the pores. And there's no change in fluorescent transport of proteins or dextran. This is not opening junctions. This appears to be mechanically activated transcytosis. So when you have physiological breathing, these particles somehow are taken up by the cell at the top, spit out at the base, across the matrix, taken up at the base, and spit out at the top. And there's an eight to tenfold increase. Now, this is not mimicking uh, a physiological response. This is a prediction. No one's ever seen this before. So we actually developed an in vivo model in, an animal, in a mouse where we could ventilate them and put a nebulizer of these same particles and measure blood flow in and out and, and have them either breathe or not breathe. And we got exactly the same results, an eight to tenfold increase with physiological breathing. So this really sort of changed the paradigm in that the idea that maybe you can mimic organ level functions in vitro. Now we started to talk to pharmaceutical companies and they, they love this, they're interested in this, but what they said, well, our real problem are human disease models because animal models are terrible. So we took this and we developed a model of pulmonary edema. This is called fluid on the lungs, you may have heard of. And we used a toxicity induced model that's a chemotherapy induced pulmonary edema. So interleukin-2 is a cytokine that's used to treat certain cancers like kidney cancer. It's FDA approved, it works. But the dose limiting toxicity is called vascular leakage syndrome where you get fluid from the vessel into the lung airspace and blood clots. You only see the blood clots on an autopsy or biopsy, but that's known to happen. So we took our device. If you have air above the epithelium, this is what it looks like. You can't see them as crisply as I could show you before. If you now give interleukin-2 at the same dose as given to patients through the intravenous injection, if you like, through the vascular channel, you see fluid filling the top like a meniscus and spreading until the entire channel is, upper channel is filled over three to four days. This is exactly the same time course at the exact same dose that's seen in humans. You could also put in fluorescent fibrinogen in the blood channel. Without interleukin-2, it just flows by. If you give interleukin-2, I'm sorry, you see blood clot formation in real time in the device, which when you do confocal is in the airspace. So you could actually study what is going on, what is the cause of this toxicity in this device. Now we could quantitate permeability using a fluorescent molecule called inulin that kidney physiolo physiologists use to measure water flux, uh, water transport. And what we found is that there's a small increase just giving interleukin-2 in water transport across the two cell layers without breathing motions. But if you have physiological breathing motions, again, you have a, a four-fold increase in fluid shift into the airspace with interleukin-2. Interleukin-2 alone, minimal breathing, and interleukin-2, interleukin you see it. You could do high-resolution imaging. You could see gaps in both the epithelium and endothelium that form that are responsible for the fluid leak. And then we went back in vivo again, and we could show that in vivo, Breathing motions, which is here, uh, the blue, again gives about a fourfold increase in fluid shift into the lung, pulmonary edema, 
with interleukin-2. This has never been seen before, another prediction. So we now have a, a disease model, and we have a toxicity model, and then we actually move to an efficacy model because I've worked on mechanotransduction for many, many years, how mechanical forces affect biochemistry, and about four years ago we showed that one of the first events when you stretch an extracellular matrix-coated subs flexible substrate with a cell on it is within five milliseconds you induce calcium influx through a stretch-sensitive ion channel called TRPV4, TRB, TRPV4. And I knew that um, GlaxoSmithKline was developing inhibitors of this channel, so we collaborated with them and they gave us inhibitors and we completely prevent pulmonary edema in this model in human cells. In parallel, they took the same drug and they did it in rabbits and dogs in a model of pulmonary edema induced by heart failure where there's back pressure from the heart and they showed the same exact thing. And we had back-to-back -back publications in science translation medicine last fall. So basically in this model we have now have, we basically have drug efficacy, disease model, and drug toxicity all in one model. And, and, and um, this has gotten the interest of the FDA and, and pharmaceutical companies, but I, it, it shows the proof of principle that this is possible. Now, Kit Parker at the Wies Institute um, has been pioneering his own approaches using microcontact printing techniques that George Whites and, Whitesides and I developed, where you can put matrix and patterns. He does them in a creative way by putting them on thin silicon, PDMS silicon rubber sheets. <coughs> Excuse me, and then he cuts the sheets out and they actually contract. And by making little cantilevers like this, he can quantitate the curvature change and quantitate contractile stress by the cells. You could also do um, electrical, optical dyes for electrical conduction and you could see uh, electrical wave conduction in these. And if you configure them in different ways, you could actually see reentrant rhythms and arrhythmias in vitro. Recently, and then Kit with GlaxoSmithKline also did a comparison with his little heart films versus rat ventricular strips where they cut out bits of heart vent muscle and that's what pharmaceutical companies use to test drugs now. And he got very similar dose responses with three different drugs in these little cells on a dish versus engineered versus uh, heart. Now the FDA gave out one of their first funding opportunities a couple of years ago and we got one of four uh, to build a heart-lung micromachine with KIT. The idea is to measure absorption and cardiotoxicity of aerosolized drugs and nanotherapeutics by delivering aerosolized drug to the airspace, having it be absorbed, go through the vessel, vascular channel, through to the heart, and then look at heart toxicity. And we are doing this right now and have some really interesting preliminary results. So to pull this together, I'm going to give you two other examples of that this actually can scale to different organs. We're working on, I think, 14 different organs right now simultaneously. So the next is called a peristaltic human gut on a chip. And the idea was we took the same system, we changed the heights, the widths, and the frequency of move deformation, and we used a human gut epithelial cells, CACO2 cells, that people know are, they came from a tumor, a human intestinal tumor. People use them in pharmaceutical industry. Everybody hates them. They say they're terrible cells because they don't differentiate very well. But we took them, we put them on this device, and we gave them cyclic peristaltic-like motions and trickling flow like in the gut. And the first thing we found is if you put them on a transwell membrane, which is the way pharmaceutical companies use them, they have to culture them for three weeks to get a barrier, to get junctions, which you see, but if you cut them from the side, they look like flat squamous cells, like skin, not like gut. Three days with flow and, and sickling strain, they, they're columnar. But if you culture them a little longer, they start like forming folds, and they turn out to form villi with crypts in vitro, which are essentially look like intestine. This is, in the, this is a millimeter in, in, the, in the chip. Now, the intestinal villus is the way you increase surface area of your intestine, these little fingers. They're lined by epithelial cells. They have tight junctions. They have brush borders to increase absorptive area more. They have proliferative crypts where the stem cells are. The stem cells only grow here. And then when they divide, the daughter cells move up and they differentiate into four lineages, absorptive cells, goblet cells, endoendocrine, and panic cells. So when you look at these cells, they form junctions. They form brush borders. 
amazingly, the proliferative cells move to the crypts. So if you do a pulse chase labeling two hours with EDU, which labels cells that are synthesizing DNA, two hours they're at the bottom, you wash it out and they migrate up the side. And then if you stain for differentiation markers, we get all the different, four, all four cell types in the exact same position. So we recreated this villus in vitro. If you do gene expression, gene microarrays across 22,000 human genes, what you find is if the cells are static, with different types of matrix, they're basically the same, they're all red. If you give them just trickling flow, they're totally different cells. You give them flow plus peristalsis, they're totally different cells again. So I tell my group, they're no bad cells, just like they're no bad kids. They just get into a bad environment. <coughs> and you give them the right environment and they come back to you. And when all of this leads to functionality. So you get physiology back. So if you look at transepithelial resistance, barrier function, much better in the chip. Paracellular permeability, expression of specific enzymes. <coughs> These cells are known not to express P450 metabolic enzymes in vitro. They don't under standard conditions. They do in our system. Glucose reuptake increased. And then these cells, one thing everyone knows is they do not produce mucus, and we get mucus production restored as well. Now, I started this project because about five years ago I started to hear about microbiome, which you hear in the news now, total paradigm shift in medicine. Diseases can be passed by taking gut microbiome from one patient or animal to another, involved many different physiological responses. You cannot culture them in vitro, because if you put microbes on your culture, it's contamination, they die. And if you put them on a trans well and you put microbes on them, they die and the, the resistance of the monolayer drops. But you put them on our system and the resistance gets better. You get better barrier function. Because these cells are differentiated, there's flow, they're putting out mucus, and you actually can keep them alive. And if I show you here, this is a movie, if you watch carefully, you can see the bacteria, they're wiggling around. These are eight different types of bacteria. They're probiotics, came from human originally, and they live in the crypts, exactly where they live in our body. So we're very excited about this. We're actually beginning to use this as a model for inflammatory bowel disease, where peristalsis, microbiome, and inflammation all contribute to the disease. Last example is a totally different approach. And the idea is a bone marrow on a chip. And this is something where the bone marrow niche is known to be critical for hematopoietic stem cells, which can repopulate your entire blood system. But it's something about the architecture of the bone marrow and, and the, the, or, the positioning of all the different cells that's critical for this. And no one's been able to build that in vitro. So I've been involved in tissue engineering since the 80s, and I know that if you do bone engineering in vivo, and you could do that by adding either demineralized bone powder or bone morphogenetic proteins, or both. No cells, just materials. The endogenous mesenchymal stem cells in your body start forming bone. And when they form bone, sometimes you see a marrow space. It's often filled with fat cells, but it looks a little like marrow. And I thought, well, maybe we can build a marrow in vivo, shape it by building it inside a little micro device, make a little cylinder, form it, get the marrow, take it out and then have a little similar shaped device that's microfluidic where you could puncture holes in the side, plug it in and keep it alive. And if it worked, you could take, make many bone marrow transplants on one or you could have in vitro blood cell manufacturing and you could study stem cell niche or look at drug toxicity. So this is what it looks like in vivo. This is a millimeter. This is two to three millimeters wide. This is bone in orange and that high power, it looks just like bone marrow. So we isolated these cells and we did fax analysis for hematopoietic stem cell markers. I won't go through these, but if you look at these bars, the right is peripheral blood. There are no stem cells. This is the mouse's own bone marrow from the femur. It's 0.1% stem cells. This is the engineered marrow at four and eight weeks. And by eight weeks, they look absolutely identical. Hematopoietic stem cells differentiate into progenitor cells. They're absolutely identical by eight weeks. Those cells will form red blood cells and white blood cells, absolutely identical. And if you look at the different types of white blood cells, lymphocytes and macrophages and so forth, they're pretty much identical. So this is marrow. And now the question is, can you keep it alive? And so we have kept it alive. 
and we compare it to, um, this is mouse marrow from femur, cultured in the state-of-the-art culture for cells, marrow cells, <coughs> which is called the dexter culture, where you have fibroblast, feeder layer, and the cells live, but they differentiate. You don't maintain the marrow type niche. This is our system for four days, we've now gone to seven, and it looks just like it does in vivo. But to see if it's really marrow, you have to do, you have to do uh, full marrow re reconstitution in lethally irradiated mice. You take a mouse, you irradiate it so that it kills all the marrow, and then you inject GFP cells in and see if you could form a complete new marrow. If you could form marrow for a few weeks, it means you had at least progenitor cells at six weeks, and we could do that. But to do it at, at longer times, you have to have hematopoietic stem cells. And we show at 16 weeks, we can get full reconstitution of blood using this device. So this device actually is now marrow that we can keep live in vitro, and we're really excited because the long-term idea is to create a human body on a chip where you literally connect these organs by the fluidic channels so that you can imagine aerosolized drug goes to the lung, you see it uh, go metabolized by the liver on a chip, peed out by the kidney on a chip, and see if it has heart toxicity with or without immune cells that come from the bone marrow on a chip. We well, give an oral drug to the gut and you see the same sort of thing. And we've got a recent grant um, to not only do this, but to build an automated instrument, because pharmaceutical companies are never going to have engineers doing this. And the idea is to have a plug and play device, almost like a DVD player, where you take a chip and you put it in a cartridge holder that would be like your disc, and you could put different discs in with the lung, the kidney, or three kidneys, or different orders, and it would basically be able to have continuous flow of fluid, blood-like blood substitute, have mass spec analysis, have microclinical analyzers, and we've funded only about nine months ago, well maybe we're getting to ten months, but we've made amazing progress. This is about three months ago, we have an incubator, this is a microscope that moves each one of these blue things is one of these chip holders, which has a chip on it. There are little IV bags that here that have the medium, and this is a big pump that flows it through, and each one of these is, so there are four on here. We've removed this pump, and we now have pumps that are the size of these little black bits here, so this entire middle is gone. We've now miniaturized it, and we're continuing to develop this, and this is the beginning of automated, we now have actually a, a four color, fluorescent microscope integrated in this. And actually, I could now, not from here, but maybe from here, I don't know, I could run it off the web, off my iPhone, and I could move the microscope around and see my cells from home to actually analyze it. So that's good for the grad students in the crowd. So that is an overview of organs on chips. It's actually a small bit of organs on chips. And before I end, I'm just going to give you a touch on a different, another platform. We have six, so this will be two. So the last one is called programmable nanomaterials. And as you can see, the idea is to create smart nanotechnologies for regenerative medicine and drug delivery and to go from implantable medical devices to injectable, programmable medical devices that are nanoscale. Dave Mooney heads this. Uh, Dave has a really exciting technology uh, that is a cancer vaccine that I like to think of as, as an artificial lymph node. He takes a tissue engineering approach to, ca to cancer vaccine development. He takes a PLG polymer. This is a FDA approved biodegradable polymer. He makes a sponge out of it, the size of a, a coin. Here's the sponge. And he puts in tumor extract. You basically take a tumor biopsy, you freeze dry it, you put the materials in here. That's your antigen. You also put in GMCSF that recruits, you implant this subcutaneously and it recruits dendritic cells, and it also has an immune adjuvant in there that would activate cells. So it recruits the dendritic cells, and because it's not at the tumor site, it doesn't have an immunosuppressive environment, they get activated by the tumor antigen there, and then those cells, when they're activated, migrate out and go to the host lymph nodes where they activate a systemic immune response. And in a B16 melanoma, they got a very high rate of regression, something like uh, 40 to 50 percent regression, and then they've done, they're doing other tumors like breast and brain, and they're getting even higher, 70% regression. And clinicians, uh, Glenn Dranoff at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, who's led clinical trials with melanoma vaccines, 
knows that those drugs, when in the same model, didn't induce any regression, they just slowed progression. So based on that, we've actually just started a human phase one clinical trial that the Wies Institute and the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute are funding, not a company, uh, to move to try this in humans. Now, what I'm going to show you are just two other examples. One is from my lab, and we were trying to target what we think is one of the most exciting targets there is, which is vascular blockage because it's the leading causing, cause of death in man. Heart attacks, stroke, pulmonary embolism, all due to clots, blood clots that obstruct a blood vessel, but there's atherosclerosis, plaques and spasms and, and various other reasons. They're all caused by obstructing a blood vessel. Now, there are known drugs that are called clot-busting drugs, like tissue plasminogen activator, TPA. They're FDA approved in the States and in Europe they're approved. They're great drugs. If you have a stroke with a blood clot in your vessel and you get to the hospital in three to four hours, they'll put in a, usually they'll put a catheter in and they'll inject it and it'll clear the clot and you can be, a lot of people are perfectly fine. But only four to five percent of eligible patients get it because it could also induce systemic bleeding and hemorrhaged in the brain. So 96% of people who could be saved can't get it. So we thought, we have a good drug. What, what if we could just get that drug and concentrate it only where the blood clot is by a systemic injection? And we thought, well, what, how do you target something to the site of a vascular occlusion? And we said, well, platelets do it all the time. That's why when you have an atherosclerotic plaque, it's vulnerable because platelets will get activated and stick and then form a clot. And the way the platelets get activated by a narrowing of a blood vessel is by shear stress. It's physic, physical law, it's physics. Narrowing increases shear stress, they get activated, they get sticky. So what we did is we developed mimics of platelets that are aggregates of nanoparticles, the nanoparticles that are made of PLGA, FDA approved biodegradable material. They're about 180 nanometers. And we shape them into a ball that's the size of a platelet, about three microns. And you could think of it like a wet ball of sand. If you have a wet ball of sand, you could shape it. But if you shear it in your hands, it falls to grains. These are tuned to, sh to break into grains at 100 dyne per centimeter square. Everything in your body, even the aorta, is below 70. So these will only break apart where, where there's an, a vascular obstruction. When they break apart, there's lower drag force, so they actually settle out. If you coat them with TPA, TPA binds fibrin, so they'll bind to the clot. And what we found is if you make a little model with microfluidics of a narrowing of a vessel, you make a little clot, and you add these particles, it actually dissolves the clot very efficiently. They bind to it, and they stick with it, and they keep dissolving it, you know, just dissolving it away from the surface. So if the clot were to move to another site, it would keep dissolving it. So we actually then went to animal models, and we had, uh, we, with Denisa Wagner, she has a, a a vascular injury model where you use a chemical in the mesentery and you get a natural thrombus to form. I'll show you that the right, it's a movie. And here the platelets are fluorescent. And so what you see is, so this is, you injure and it's many minutes and the clots keep forming over many spaces. But with the inje one injection, you see the clot form and then it breaks up and then it forms and then it breaks up. And then it, does, and it basically dissolves away. So then we went to a, a different model where we, we basically formed a clot, and we injected into the pulmonary artery of a, it rejected into a mouse, the vein, but it got clogged up in the pulmonary artery, and it's a model of pulmonary embolism. And 100% of these animals die in 45 minutes because of massive pulmonary embolism. When we give one injection of these particles, 80% survive. But we use one hundredth the dose, a dose that if you give in a soluble form has no effect on bleeding at all. But because they're all concentrated right at the site, we could actually get impact. So this is something we're actually moving now towards a startup and hopefully towards, towards the clinic as well. Um, and we're really excited about it because it could be used to deliver any kind of drug to any kind of occlusion. So if you have sickle cell crisis where the blood, red blood cells stack up and block a vessel, you get high shear stress, you could deliver a drug or, uh, or constriction, et cetera. And this is cool, but, but the future is even more bizarre. Okay, so we have people working at the Wies Institute on um, developing 
using DNA not as an information material but as a building material. In biophysics, we actually know exact, precise curvature in, that, that DNA takes and the mechanical properties, the stiffness based on forming complementary, com based on complementarity. <clears throat> and it's really, DNA is a molecular spring, so you can think of building things with springs. A few years ago, Eric Winfrey and Paul Ruthemann in Caltech developed a technique called DNA origami. They took a huge uh, a plasmid of M13, it's a circular DNA, you know every nucleotide, and then they made short bits of DNA that are complementary, part of the, half of it's complementary at one site and half at another. So imagine this room is a big circle of DNA and I have a DNA here, this big, that the left half binds there and the right half binds here. So what happens is it acts like a staple and you get a big figure eight. And if you add thousands of these in different places, you can make it fold up any way you want. So the first paper here, they, they took this big circle, the little, little uh, staples, and it folded up, as you'll see in a second, to a rectangle. And this, on the nanometer scale, this is like 80 nanometers. And this was a paper in science, or nature, I can't remember which. And in the next paper, they did this, and they made a map of the United States, and then they made a map of the Western Hemisphere. And then William Shi, who's at our institute, started to work in 3D. And what you see here is a design of an icosahedron. It looks like a viral capsid. And this is an electron micrograph through what, hap through what bi is built. So we have CAD CAM software on the web site that you basically say, I want to build any structure. You design it. It tells you what all goes to order. You order them. They arrive. You mix them with M13. You shake them in a tube, and these things form any shape you want. And now they're beginning to cover, you know, working on making artificial cells out of these as well. So Peng Yin joined us as a junior faculty member. He's had multiple nature and science papers. He can make a different approach. He takes small DNA hairpins, easier to cheaper to make, and he programs them so when they bind, they, they, there's sort of a chain reaction and they change conformation and they assemble, self-assemble. And he could make then build nanotubes of any size you want, like 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, every one the same size. And then recently, he's, he's almost made them like pixels, so you could, these are fonts at 80 nanometer scale that he built out of just shaking these in tubes, these just form. And then a few months later, he did this in 3D, and all these structures form just when you shake them together, and you could program them. So, I love this stuff, and I told all the guys, great, more science and nature papers, but at the Wies Institute, we need to do something useful. So why don't you try to make something out of this? So um, Sean Douglas, who started with William and then did work with George Church, designed what, what, we, what is basically a programmable nanorobot cancer therapy. So at the left, what we have what we call a clamshell. It's all DNA, and it, it, it's basically two halves of, of, this, of, the, of the, the cylinder hexagonal you know, column that have, have a springs at the end and are clasped shut by those little fingers, like a purse, woman's clasps. Those fingers are DNA optimers, which act like antibodies. They will bind specific molecules. And when they bind, they, they dissociate. And when they, both of them open, the box springs open, as shown here. And when it's open, inside the box, which can't normally be seen, are ligands for cell surface receptors, in this case, apoptosis receptors, suicide receptors. So only when it's open, cell will bind it and it will die. Plus, because you have these two sites and you could use different aptums, you could program them so that it'll only open with one binds or two binds or one and the other or different types. And with this, in science, they were able to show that you can make them that only kill Burkitt's lymphoma cells only kill AML cells, only kill T cell, leukemia, AML, so forth. You could actually program these so that they will only go bind and kill. So this is sort of a feel for the future. I invite you to our website. We won the Webby last year. That's the Academy of the Ward of the Internet. We won it for science. We beat out Wired Magazine and NASA Space Propulsion Lab. It's a very exciting site, lots of videos, a lot going on. But I think the message is, you know, I think we th really feel that the future is multidisciplinarity at a, at, a, at a higher level, where we're not only dealing with disciplines, we're also dealing with people from different 
industries and from academia and industry together. And that uh, I think you need both approaches. I think you need to pursue fundamental research, but you also have to think how is it going to have impact on the world because the current funding climate is one where our society really has invested for years and they're expecting to see things come back. And also, you can do fundamental science in, in, a, in a route that's towards application or not, and why not do it in a path that's actually going to have impact. So with that, I'm end. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer questions. Very exciting talk, and I've seen the play, so I, I'm really pretty much impressed by, by what you have done there. Uh, one of the major keys in uh, inflammatory bowel disease is neural plexus, because it is uh, associated to the remodeling after inflammation. Did you ever try to co-culture, to co-locate co uh, CACO3 cells with uh, neural stem cells in your chip? You know, the way we start all these organs is we start as simple as possible, and if we can't mimic a response, then we know we're missing something. So I didn't mention this, but in the pulmonary edema model, we didn't have immune cells. And when we submitted the paper, one reviewer said this paper should not be accepted. It's too simple. They don't have immune cells. The other reviewer said this is amazing. They just showed that you don't need immune cells to get pulmonary edema with this with this drug. And so you, you can learn a lot, but it's a synthetic approach. So if we can't mimic certain feature of inflammatory bowel disease, then we could add it back. But to start building complexity from the beginning does not help anyone. So every person that comes to my lab wants to build a whole organ, and that's not what we do. We start with as simple as possible. Okay. And uh, could you please elaborate a little bit more on your work with uh, neural cells, with brain? So um, we are just, we have a new postdoc who just started a collaboration with Albert Vandenberg's group of building a blood-brain barrier with human brain endothelium and astrocytes. And the idea there is, is basically then, if, once we have that, now we can put neurons on top to see, can you get drugs across and can they have efficacy? I, we had a good discussion this morning. I, I, I still think uh, there may be things like uh, seizure models that are, are useful. Kit Parker has been working for years on traumatic, traumatic brain injury, and he's done stuff on microcontact printing and orienting nerve cells. He's done, uh, he's done actually some beautiful work on traumatic brain injury using that. But I, my, my own group, has, we're not doing a lot right now. Um, I was quite impressed with your first example with the magnetic nanoparticles and how the, you can cleanse. Yeah, yeah, right, and then cleanse the, the blood. So my question is, uh, if you do this in vivo, uh, you're going to lose some of the nanoparticles, and then they will go into the bloodstream. Is we, this good? Is this good? Yeah, well, it's, it's I mean, not, we get a, we get virtually 100 percent back. 100 percent. We're so efficient, and. But uh, the particles that we're using are already FDA approved because they do, they cleanse bone marrow uh, transplants of certain cells using those particles. And there may be some that get back there, but it, the nanoparticles are probably fine. Uh, you know, larger particles above 10 microns, 5 to 10 microns is a bigger problem. But the goal is to have virtually none get back to the patient. But if they go through, I mean, going, I mean, I'm not uh, yeah. an expert in this. But if they go through the heart, I mean, is this okay? I mean, uh, having nanoparticles going through your heart? Oh, you have na people use nanoparticle, inject nanoparticles all the time. It's all okay. sorts of drug delivery systems or nanoparticle imaging systems or nanoparticles. It depends on the scale of it. It's even people even do small micrometer particles. It's when you get above five to ten. That to get above ten is a, is the real problem. But you try to stay below five. Mike, 
very impressive talk. Thanks a lot. I was wondering about the last part with the DNA folding little toys. It, uh, <laughs> it's really beautiful, but, and you've shown that you can attack specific cell types. Have you tried uh, to see if you can attack cancer cells? Those are all different cancer cells. Oh, okay. So there was acute myoblastic you know, anemia, uh, leukemia and acute lymphocytic. Based, the point was you could take all these different immune cell cancers and you could target one but not the other. You could, that kind of specificity. Okay, thanks. Beautiful. And that was work of Sean Douglas and George Church. I, I wasn't on that. It, could, it, it, could, it should be able to target a stem cell, it could, you know, deliver something to a stem cell and activate or not just kill it. The point is, it depends on the aptamers that you put on it. And that's, that's a, you know, there's a whole industry in terms of drug of companies developing aptamers. It's people, yeah. Uh, it's people and uh, people who are free to create and develop because uh, uh, perhaps what is the difference in other places like this is that we can plan it, but we can also in lots of ways and then plan to put them down yep. and keep them. I think it's great here that you have similar, you know, biologists, engineers, physicists together and easy to work with one another. Most places are, are, are channelized, so that's something you should continue to take advantage of. Okay, thank you.